Thank you all. So we just heard some really affecting words from that last panel, um, a discussion about how running for your life you know, causes one to lose their innocence, their childhood. Um, and we are here to talk about school safety. So I want each of you to talk to me a little bit about what a safe school looks and feels like. Charles, let's start with you. Sure. So a safe school, my answer honestly is twofold. Uh, first, I think there has to be an ethereal, entrenched feeling of love and affection, connection, familiarity that is between the young people as well as adult to young person and frankly adult to adult the overarching feeling needs to be one of love it's not a term i think we talk a lot about in education but i talk about love specifically around recognizing this goal of teaching and raising young people so that ethereal feeling is the first part and i would say the second part is systemic tangible experience of that love so accountability measures, um, structures that are behavioral, structures that are responsive, but before that, structures that are proactive. So a conversational tone that is systematically set up, um, confirming that ethereal feeling of affection. I think those two things are what creates safe space and safe schooling. I absolutely agree with them. Uh, and the research shows us uh, when we look at preventing things uh, that uh, if you go back to the 2004 Sca Safe School Initiative uh, that was done by the Secret Service and National Threat Assessment Center, it's somebody knew something. And if they have that connection, uh, as Chuck said, and they have that trusted adult uh, in the community, in the school, uh, we can work toward uh, prevention and work toward, uh, you know, and, and exactly as Chuck said, that connection that somebody has. Uh, when, when that's there, they have someone to go to, uh, that's when we can prevent. Sure. Um, I agree with everything that, that has been said already, and I would just add uh, two things also, uh, trust and communication. Thinking about trust, I guess they're related to one another, right? Having a, an open relationship between teachers with one another, uh, teachers and students, certainly, and positive communication so that when if students are concerned about something, they're able to talk to one another, they're able to talk to the teachers that are in their lives, they're able to say what's bothering them, they're able to feel safe in their space to use their words and, and not have to resort to anything else to, to feel safe in their space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. The conversation around um, safety in schools has really been revolving around one specific threat <laughs> recently, which is the threat of gun violence in schools. Jen, you have had some actual experience, firsthand experience with guns in schools. So I want you to tell the audience a little bit about that. Sure, so this was a long time ago uh, when I was a second year teacher. I was teaching in, in Brooklyn in a public school and I was teaching second grade. Um, I had a student who, uh, on, on his third warning, he was playing with Pokemon cards and I told him that I would take them and give them back to him at the end of the day and he took a gun out of his desk that I didn't know was there, and he said, I don't care, I have a gun and I'll shoot you. Um, and I went up to him, I, I had never seen a gun before in my life, um, and the rest of the students in my class started doing exactly what you'd think guns, students would do. Um, they were sort of screaming, and, and I went over to him and I put a hand on his face, and I said, oh, no, sweetie, you don't wanna do that, and I took it away from him and called down to the office and, and they came up. Um, and later I found out that the gun, the gun wasn't loaded and that he had learned this, these words and this behavior, he said, from watching his dad do that to his mom. Mm -hmm. And he was seven. And so my immediate my immediate reaction, this was um, post-Columbine, but before school shootings became part of the national conversation in the way that they are now. And so I was, given, I was given a choice in terms of what happened to him. He could be expelled, suspended, he could stay in my class, or he could be switched to somebody else's class. I chose to have him switched to somebody else's class. Now, looking back, I wish that I had kept him with me 
I have a lot of compassion for him in a way that I didn't have as a second year teacher. I had compassion, but also was scared because it felt so new. Uh, I didn't know how to handle it. Um, yeah. So when you think back to that time, you know, as we think now about what teachers need in order to deal with this threat in school, what is the thing that you wish you had? Is it a specific training? Is it a weapon? Is it someone else in the school that had a weapon? So I really sort of adamantly am very thankful that I did not have a weapon, and I'm really glad that nobody else in my school had a weapon. I can imagine a situation in which um, even, it, I, as I said, I clearly had not um, ever seen a gun before. I would not have been really a good, necessarily a good candidate. Um, but let's say even that I had been trained to carry a weapon or someone else had, they would have seen a, a young Hispanic boy pointing a gun at me. I'm obviously, a, I was a young white woman um, with children crying. And I worry that he would have been shot. I worry that I would have, in the, in the panic of, of the moment, done something that I would have regretted. And I don't know that for sure, right? Um, the argument has been made to me that guns don't change people. If your instinct was to go over to him with compassion, that would have been your instinct if you had a gun. Um, so I don't know for sure what my own instinct would have been, but I worry deeply that if there had been someone armed in the school at that moment, he could have been hurt and he didn't need to be. Um, it was a school that was um, struggling. It was a school, not, not just in the school, but the community around the school. And I'm aware that the, the conversation around gun violence is broader than a, just a school conversation. Right. So I don't know that it's something that I necessarily need, but I think it's, it's part of a larger conversation about what makes schools safe. Yeah. Um, is not just about guns in or out of schools. So Jen's story makes me think of, or brings up two specific things for me. One is this child, the seven-year-old, saying, I learned this behavior at home. I learned this behavior from watching people close to me threaten other people this way. And then something else Jen said, which is community <laughs> um, and where this school fits in the community and how children in that community behave both in school and out. So Charles and Mark, I'm wondering how you guys are thinking about dealing with kids who, school isn't the only place they ever are, right? Uh, Charles, a lot of your kids have had to deal with violence outside of school and school is supposedly their safe space. So I'm wondering how you guys think about the interplay between what's going on outside of school and what happens in and what that means for kids. I think the conversations around school violence need to be grounded a little more contextually, like along the lines of what, what you just described. So that's not to say that school shootings aren't extraordinarily problematic, but it is to say that the day in, day out touches of safe schools really are premised on these contextual things. So like the violence that the brothers I work with experience outside of school, it doesn't stop when they come in. It troubles them, it worries them, it prompts them, it compels them. It is a huge part of them day in, day out. So to expect them to somehow divorce this traumatic, violent experience that they have outside and come inside and be safe is, it's unreasonable, it's not grounded in anything real. Um, but instead, I think having conversations about what they experience outside, what are we gonna do about it inside? Um, and certainly, how do we honor what your experience is as a means of making school actually a safe space day in, day out. If that context got as much energy as the school shooting gets, I think our experience of safe schools would be significantly stronger. And uh, schools are representative of the community. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's in the community is gonna come into the school. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one thing I wanted to speak to, um, sort of what, what Jen uh, had said and, and the approach that uh, sort of we've been taking with preparing teachers. Uh, you know, many years ago, I was a teacher 20 years ago, and 20 years ago when I taught, 
there were a series of codes that came out over the loudspeaker that said, you know, the brown bear is in the lobby. And you're like, why is there a brown bear in the lobby? But it, it meant something. Um, and, and you waited for direction from the office. That was your, your job was to wait, and they were going to tell you what to do. Um, and we've been trying to, at least in Frederick County, try and empower educators, make them aware of what those range of options are to them and empower them to make decisions right then and there that can affect the lives um, of children. Now with that, they have to, we do some um, understanding of uh, the psychology and the sociology behind what happens in those emergency events, getting through uh, things like normalcy bias and understanding that something's going on and then have a range of things. And you know, there's a number of models out there. We, we chose to use the avoid, deny, defend model, but we look to empower the staff to say, you know, where you are, look at your range of options you know, when you have those several options and, you know, if you have that option to avoid, make the decision to avoid, you know, don't wait for the office to tell you, you know, what it is that you're supposed to do. You know, use, see everything that you have and be empowered to make a decision to make a difference for those kids. And, uh, you know, as we go through that continuum, those are the things that we're trying to do to, to prepare teachers uh, to act in that. But it's very difficult. We have, uh, it's difficult for us to even, uh, you know, at times to get police officers, firefighters and everyone to, get that stress inoculation to train to, to make decisions under those circumstances. But at least if we educate on people, these are the psychological things that are going to happen. These are your physio physiological things that are going to happen to you in extreme stress. And this is how you fight through them to, to get a range of options to make a difference mm -hmm. um, in that critical moment is, is what we're working toward. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering when you have a situation at a school, what are the calculations that you are making about how to deal with that, how to deal with a child who perhaps has brought a weapon in or a child who might be causing harm to another child but is still, in fact, a child? If, if I could, that's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, that's one thing I think we missed on the other part is that real team approach. You know, we've got to have uh, good continuity between, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the mental health community, the school, uh, the mental health services that the school provides, and then law enforcement, and that we can make a decision and we can work together. Um, it's one of the things that, uh, you know, being in school-based policing for a long time, having a good strong MOU about who's going to do what, and that we look at these things that, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, and for us in school-based policing, looking at that we don't measure our success on the, on the collars that we make. Uh, you know, that's not our function. Our function is about the difference that we make for those, those children in that time and that family and making sure that we can get all those things together um, in that period. So uh, I think that's a, a missing piece, too, is that making sure that there's that strong continuity between all of the, the schools can't do it on their own, mm -hmm. uh, the mental health community can't do it on their own, and, and we know for certain the police can't do it on their own. So the only way we can do that is if we all have a, a good, clear picture of what everyone's doing and pushing toward that outcome. I think for us on the school level, and, and I don't mean to even differentiate the school resource officers from the school level, I think they're certainly school level, too. Um, specifically Ron Brown, Howard, Bell, Day, Tucker. Like, I can name our school resource officers. Um, but that said, I think that for us it often looks like differentiating and really individualizing our response. So if a weapon comes in the building, like, whose is it? How did it happen? Come here, like, sit down. Like, my man, what what is going on? Like, this is a blade. Like, what? I didn't know it was there. I had beef on the train. It's from my sailing team, and it's a particular type of knife we have to use. Like the breadth of answers that come out, you know, can really help direct like what happens next. Um, certainly, it's all problematic. Like my man is still a knife, mm -hmm. but <laughs> but that said, oh, it's a different conversation when that knife was intended for harm as opposed to it was accidental. The, Thankfully, we haven't had any like pistols in the building or, or like an actual like firearm, but I would imagine that the process around that has to be different. Uh, but that said, in either situation, for us, school resource officers are also a part of that conversation. So it really has to be like a communal but individualized response um, to really adaptively address weapons and so on. And Charles, you talked about this a little, but I'm wondering, what is the conversation around school shootings like filtered through the lens of your kids who you know, are perhaps more acquainted with violence on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, what are they thinking about and talking about when it comes to school shootings? I think that students of color in public school spaces in major cities have a general feeling of like marginalization in the conversations around school shootings. 
um, because the school shootings aren't happening in big cities, right? Like there's not a school shooting happening in Chicago or in DC. Um, but that said, I think their experience of school violence isn't necessarily less, it is different. And I think the marginalization comes in with the heavy focus on these discrete instances that are for sure problematic. They are just not considerate conversation-wise of the day in, day out exposure to trauma, you know, a block or two blocks from my house. So, so I think for them, a lot of the conversation is, you know, this is us every day. Like that, that my, my dad has the pistol, my uncles, like the old buddy on the street. Like none of this is, is far-fetched for us, but no one seems to be having that conversation. So in short, I think their experience is one of marginalization in the bigger conversation. Mm -hmm. around. Jen, you now work with soon-to-be teachers, young teachers. I'm wondering what their concerns are entering the classroom uh, in this day and age, and then also what you think they need to best be prepared. So, it, as we were talking about the last question, I was thinking about the fact that so often s teacher candidates or soon-to-be teachers, and, and even new teachers, I think, don't necessarily know who the team might be. Right, so who are all of the people that they go to inside of schools and outside of schools? How do they find the resources that they need regardless of the, the type of school that they're teaching in, um, both public school, private school, uh, the community in which they're, they're teaching in? I think the, the needs of each school are certainly community-based and we've seen time and time again that the needs are both similar and different. Um, schools, regardless of where they are, have kids who have real and important needs. And I see my students struggle with, oh my gosh, what do I do? What do I do if this happens to me in my school, in my classroom? We've talked about that. I have talked to them about the fact that the conversation, particularly around school shootings, is rightfully sort of taking up the air in, in the room right now. But more than preparing, it, more than living through a school shooting, thankfully, they're going to need to talk to their students, however young they are, about what a school shooting means. They're gonna have to comfort them in the aftermath of a school shooting in a, in a school close by. Um, and hopefully none of them will, will live through or, or protect students through a school shooting. Um, they're scared. Regardless of the statistics, um, they're scared both to live through a school shooting and to to have the resources available to to just talk to students about what it means. Um, how do you talk to a seven year old about what a lockdown drill is or why you're having one? How do you talk to fifteen year olds about what a lockdown drill is or why you're having one? And I think they're the the thing that they are feeling most now is pressure and fear, and where do they find the resources? How do they know about them? And so those are the conversations that we're. So my my job feels like a, a sort of tempering of some of that fear, trying to put it into context. Um, school violence isn't always a shooting; it's um, sometimes more subtle than that. It's bullying. It's fights. It's um, yeah. So there, there's a lot that, that we need to talk about with, with young teachers, I think. And there's a question about whether that training should change or what should mm -hmm. be part of, uh, you know, we've had that discussion. I, I do a lot of uh, speaking at educational leadership programs, and sometimes that's the only emergency discussion that a budding principal will get as part of that mm -hmm. academic program that leads to it, and whether or not, you know, we need changes and need emphasis uh, for educational leaders in emergency management and crisis leadership. Uh, is, is sort of a question. I, uh, the system that I work with at 67 school buildings spread over 664 square miles with 46,000 uh, students and staff. And uh, at times I, I would either get called Santa Claus, because I would hope not because weight related, but um, <laughs> that they would see me once a year or the Grim Reaper, because whenever any one of those schools is having their worst day, uh, I would be there for, and I would be able to see people acting in a school on their worst day. Um, in our in our system, um, and uh, you know, I really look at that of what what is the 21st century uh, educator training and certification look like 
based on these problems. Mm -hmm. So I want to let the audience know that we are going to come to you for questions in just about a minute or two. If you could do me a favor and start thinking about your questions now, truncate them down, make sure that they're questions, <laughs> um, and then get those hands up high, we have mic runners in the audience. Um, so we've talked about a couple of different things, training, um, de-escalation. I remember when I was younger, there was a big conversation going on about, should all schools have metal detectors? And if they do, what does that do to the psyche of students coming in? So when you think about the schools that you work in, the teachers that you work with now, in the coming years, what do you think the biggest thing, the biggest change in that environment could be that would make schools safer without making kids constantly feel like they're on alert? Charles, I will start with you. That's a great question. I, I think that my answer is probably one of really embracing the simplicity of connections. So, so sort of consistent with what Jim was saying, certainly consistent with what Mark was saying, this idea of knowing who is who in the school, um, knowing like who, it, what team is there to be identified. At Ron Brown in DC, we have the care team, the culture and restorative efforts team. Every young king in our building would know very clearly if there was something chaotic, problematic, I'm going to one of those six people and I'm gonna address this with them. They also know that that pipeline is, that, that communication line is open. So for me, I think my answer would be like really firming simple, uh, communication structures in a building such that it's not just there in name, but it's also there in practice. There is an identifiable group of loving individuals that I can take whatever to. Um, yeah. I, th I think, um, you know, obviously it's going to be that risk-based look at what the school security look like. Um, and all of those things come at a cost. There's a, there's a trade-off between um, if we're spending money for metal detectors and security and everything else, then there's less education money for other things. Uh, and if we see the way things have gone in Florida with the legislation there requiring school resource officers and some um, absolute headbutts between sheriff's offices and police agencies and, uh, and you know, the school systems about who's going to pay for what, I don't think that's going to get us anywhere. And I worry about that, you know, the, the spread of that, too. And we look at what makes the most sense. And, and you know, having a one-size-fits-all for all parts of this country that are so radically different, uh, you know, I don't think that there's one answer. I think it's, it's got to be community-based. It's got to be things around, you know, just as, as, as Chuck said about the context. The context for all of these things for school security is so important. It looks a lot different in Frederick County than it does in D.C., mm -hmm. um, and, and for good reason. Uh, you know, based upon what what the, what are the community's desires and what's what's the what what risk what risk mitigation strategies do you want to put in place? I think we need to help our young teachers learn to have hard conversations with their students, not be afraid to ask them questions, to hear hard answers, and embrace the 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 messiness that comes along with having those hard conversations. I think that'll go a long way. Right. Want to go to the audience for questions? I think we have one back there. It's working. Hi, my name is Shelley Porges uh, with New, uh, Living School New Orleans, a new concept charter school that will be opening in 2019. Question, uh, our kids are learning critical lessons here, obviously, themselves as we go through this um, challenging time. I'm wondering if you could comment further on the other aspects of the learning environment uh, as it relates to the things we oh, have always intended them to learn in school as opposed to, sadly, these, these lessons. You want to take that, Charles? Sure. I, th I think that the learning environment, it, it, could I ask a clarifying question? <laughs> Do you mean like how the learning environment is affected by the safety issues? How the learning, yes. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, so I think that the things that we have always intended for students to learn, you know, the reading, writing, and arithmetic certainly remain important. I think Unfortunately, we haven't always been thoughtful about the other things that they need to also intentionally learn, self-regulation, empathy, coping. Um, and I do think that, unfortunately, like the violence conversation has created a space where those conversations have to be had, but they're having to be had in a crisis mode. And so I think when we can become more proactive and have conversations that are, that are prior to responding, but preventive, those spaces can allow more reading, writing, and arithmetic to happen unencumbered 
uh, because there's also a comparable coping, empathy, social and emotional learning space. Yeah, and I think we have a question right here. Hi, my name is Mark Barnett, and I have a question. Uh, we've talked about safe and secure, secure schools solely in the context of school violence, but um, students confront lead, asbestos, mm -hmm. mold in their schools. Should this be part of the safe and secure schools mm -hmm. conversation as well? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that seems like one. You mm -hmm. Oh, um, <laughs> the short answer is probably yes. Um, I think when we're thinking about school safety, we want to take a, a broad lens to this, right? What does it mean for our kids to be safe in school? Certainly it means environmentally safe, physically safe, emotionally safe. I don't, this conversation certainly focused on being physically safe, right? It's safe from, from school shootings, safe from gun violence. But absolutely, I think if we were to broaden this conversation, there, there's a lot that goes into keeping our kids safe at school. Um, you raise a really good point. Left out of this conversation is a lot because we have been sort of laser focused on the thing that has been most, most immediately and fatally harmful for our students right now, and that's been gun violence. Um, but absolutely, keeping our kids safe from environmental harm is absolutely part of what it means to have a safe school. So you've raised a great point, um, and thank you for it. Yeah, I wanna ask the audience to join me in thanking our panel. Thank you.